good morning. It's good to be here in Singapore. We have a lot of teaching over the next few days. Thank you for coming. Why do some churches baptize babies and other churches baptize believers? Why do some churches insist on tithing and other churches leave giving to the free will? Why do some churches worship on Sunday and others worship on Saturday or Friday evening? Why do some churches marry divorcees and other churches don't? Why do some churches support Israel and other churches ignore Israel? And yet all of us have the same Bible. We have come to such different conclusions and different practices, all out of the same Word of God. There's something that needs examining. And I want to talk to you this morning about one word, the word covenant. Because all these differences are a misunderstanding of the word covenant in Scripture. And in these first talks to you, I want to show how it is an interpretation of the word covenant that lies behind so many differences between churches. In my estimation, it is the most important word in Scripture. Others believe the word kingdom is, but the word kingdom does not uh, figure very highly in the Old Testament, which is three quarters of your Bible. It does figure in the New Testament, but I don't think that's the key word. I think covenant is. And we're going to look at the different covenants of Scripture. Now first we must define what we mean by covenant. And I can do it best by contrasting with contract. We are far more familiar with contracts than with covenants. And that's one of our problems. Both are binding agreements between two parties and both carry serious obligations and conditions. And yet a covenant is totally different from a contract. Most of our lives are based on contracts. And a contract is an agreement between two equal parties who are in a position to negotiate with each other. And they don't sign a contract until they have arrived at mutually agreed conditions. Let me illustrate that. You want to build a property in Singapore. So you get hold of a building contractor. And then you negotiate with that building contractor how much it will cost how long it will take to build, and many other conditions. And once you've agreed on the conditions, you sign the contract solemnly. But if either of you does not abide by the conditions, the contract becomes null and void. If you don't pay the bills on time, the builder is free from the contract. If he doesn't produce the building on time and at cost, you are free from the contract. It has been mutually agreed and settled because you are both in a strong position. You are in the strong position of having the money that he wants and he is in the strong position of having the skill and the material that you want. And so you are both able to negotiate. Most business is done on contracts. Most of our lives are based on various contracts with or without conditions. Now a covenant is very different. It is a unilateral agreement between someone in a strong position 
and someone in a weak position. And therefore there is no negotiation. Nobody can alter the terms which are settled by the stronger partner. And the other person has no freedom except to agree or disagree, to accept the covenant or reject it. But that's the only freedom they have. They cannot alter it. Like contracts, a covenant is also based on promises. But the promises are not the result of mutual negotiation. In the ancient world, one of the most common uses of a contract were between a king who had conquered another country and settled the terms on which he would occupy that country and allow the people in that conquered land to live. And so the conqueror settled the terms of the contract, or rather of the covenant, and the people had no choice except to accept the terms or reject them, which meant rebellion and revolution. In most cases, they accepted, because that, in that lay their peace and their future security. And so the king conquering the country would say, these are the terms of my covenant, do you accept? And the only response that they could make was, I will, or we will, or we won't. Now I hope you've got the clear difference between a covenant and a contract. There are no contracts in Scripture, but one of the things people are always trying to do is to make a contract with God, and you can't do that. The reason is very simple. We have nothing that God wants. We have nothing that He needs. One of my favorite texts is in Psalm 50, and God says in that psalm, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. That's a lovely verse to put us all in our place. And he then gives the reasons why. He says the cattle on a thousand hills are mine, and all the silver and the gold is mine. We need to remember that, especially when we're in such a wealthy center of trade as Singapore. All the silver and gold in Singapore belongs to the Lord. It's only on loan to us, and we need to remember that. You cannot ever get God into your debt. You cannot ever have Him under obligation to you. There was a man in our church in England, and he came to me one day and he said, David, I was a soldier in, the, in World War II, and in the thick of one of the biggest battles, I really believed I might die. And he said, I made a bargain with God. And I said, God, if you will restore me to my family, I will go to church every Sunday for the rest of my life. Rather similar outlook to Jacob in the Bible. When Jacob said, if you bring me safely back to my father's house, I'll give you a tithe of all that I possess, a tenth. That's making bargains, trying to get God tied down to a contract. I'm afraid it still happens even among Christians who believe that if they tie their income or even give more than that, that they've got God under obligation to give them money back. That's not the relationship that you can have with God, because God doesn't make contracts with anybody. But He is a covenant-making God, and the only relationship we can have with, with Him is in one or other of his covenants. And he settles the terms of the covenant, and we either accept them or we reject them. We can't do anything less or anything more. 
Well, now let's just explore further. Are there any covenants in our life? Let's begin with marriage. I'm going to ask you a question now, and you can participate by raising your hand. How many of you think marriage is a covenant, and how many think it's a contract? Let's just see. How many of you think marriage is a contract? Let me see. Oh, you're not playing games with me. <laughs> you don't like raising your hand in a meeting. How many think it's a covenant? Oh, unanimous. Well, that's because you've read your Bible sometime. In God's sight, marriage is a covenant. But in modern liberal secular society, marriage is more and more of a contract, of a negotiated agreement between a man and a woman, or now between a man and a man, and a woman and a woman. But it's regarded as a contract. If people realized that marriage was a covenant, there would never be any divorce and therefore no remarriage. But they haven't seen that. Most people in modern, liberal, secular society regard marriage as a contract. And therefore, if either party does not keep the terms of the contract, the other party is regarded as free to go and marry someone else. And that's why there are now so many divorces and broken marriages with all the dreadful toll that takes of the children in such marriages. So you believe marriage is a, co a covenant, obviously, but the world doesn't. And that's one of the points of great tension between Christians and society today. It is a covenant, and I heard of a man in the north of England whose wife, shortly after their marriage, got into bad ways, and she finished up as a prostitute on the streets. And his friends told him, she's no good to you. Get a divorce and find a woman who will be a proper mate for you and a help to you. And he turned round on them with anger, and he said, never speak to me like that about her. She's my wife, and I shall love her as long as there's breath in her body. And shortly after, she died of her bad ways. And as she lay dying, he was there, with his hands spread over her in love and prayer. That's a covenant marriage. It's not a contract. There was every reason why he should have been free from the contract, but he refused to take them because he saw his marriage as a covenant before God. See the difference? Well, then we've got to find some other agreement between people in our daily life which we can use to illustrate covenant. We can no longer use marriage as the illustration. Well, I can think of one other. I don't know if this applies in Singapore or not. But in our country, if you give to a charity, you can claim the tax back that you've paid on that for charity. Can you hear? Yes. And it's called in our country covenanted giving. It is freely entered into, and the government repays the tax on anything you give to a charity. And many charities, including churches, benefit greatly from this return tax, this covenanted gift. It's freely entered into by one party only. The government doesn't demand it. A person freely enters into a gift for a charity, and therefore the government promises to give the tax back. 
That's maybe a reasonable illustration. But there's an even better one. And it's based on the fact that covenant and testament are one and the same word. They both mean the same thing. And when your Bible is divided into Old Testament and New Testament, it's really saying Old Covenant and New Covenant. Actually, those titles are quite wrong, as we shall see. I don't know who thought of them, but it was a big mistake. Nevertheless, they are saying Old Covenant and New Covenant, Old Testament and New Testament. And when people die in England, they usually, hopefully, leave a last will and testament. It's called in law. There's the word again. And when you make a will, and I hope you have because it causes an awful lot of bother to your relatives if you don't. If you've made a last will and testament, you have made a covenant. You have promised to give your money or your property to such and such a relative or friend, and you have freely entered into that covenant, and uh, no one has forced you into it. You may make conditions in it, if you will. One of the common conditions is that you won't inherit my money until you are 21 years of age. Or even, <clears throat> I will leave you my money and property if you change your surname to mine. That's not unknown in last will and testaments. So there may be conditions, but most wills are unconditional. And you simply say what you want to leave to each person. And the thing I want you to notice is that will and testament does nothing until you die. And then it becomes effective immediately. And the same is true of the new covenant in the Bible. The New Testament takes up the very same argument I've just used, that until Jesus died, the new covenant could not come into being. But as soon as Jesus died, the night before he died, he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, meaning that when I shed my blood, the new covenant will come into operation. You'll find that argument in the letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament. But let's go back to this difference between covenant and contract. <clears throat> God is a covenant-making God. And you cannot have a, any relationship with him until you enter one of his covenants. And you then become his covenant people. More than that, you enter into his covenant love. The Hebrew word for that is chesed, which is usually translated in English as loving kindness. And it means covenant love. And it's a love that has loyalty at the heart of it. Because every covenant is based on promises. Promises that God makes to provide something or other for us. And our covenant with him is simply limited to the word, we will. Of course, I will is the longest sentence in the English language. It was a cynical view of marriage that told me that. I will, the longest sentence <laughs> in the English language. But that's at the heart of marriage. I will, we will, we do. It's a promise in response to a proposal. Now, actually, marriage, even though you regard it as a covenant, has become a double covenant. When marriage began, 
It was between two unequal partners, between the strong man and the weaker woman. And there are vestiges of that even today in the fact that men do the proposing and women accept or not. I don't know if that's still the practice here, I should think so, but uh, we've now entered this egalitarian society in which the woman can propose. But originally, it was the man, the stronger of the two, who proposed to the weaker. And also that was why the bride was given away by her father to the bridegroom. The man who had been responsible for her gave her away to the man who was going to be responsible for her. The mothers didn't enter into it. It was the fathers, the men who were the stronger partner. Likewise, when a couple marries, certainly in England still, the wife takes the husband's surname. She becomes part of him. He doesn't take her name. Though again, that is now changing as it becomes more of a two-way contract. There are people now doubling their surname and hyphening it and keeping the name of the bride and the groom together. It won't be long before the men will take the woman's surname. In a liberal society, anything goes. So marriage used to be a covenant because it was made by the man to the woman. But now it has already become a double covenant and the wife or the bride takes the same promises as the bridegroom. So it's already departed from the biblical notion of marriage, where the bridegroom proposed, was accepted, and at the marriage, the bride was taken from her own home and transferred to the bridegroom's home and given his name. And he promised to keep her and be faithful to her. She didn't make any promises except to accept the covenant. So I hope now that you understand the difference. And God is a covenant-making God. He is not a contractual God. And however hard you try to get him into your debt, you will not succeed. Because God is the all-powerful. And by comparison, we are the weak partner in the covenant. And we have nothing we can offer him except our loyalty. That's behind every covenant in Scripture. And it's an amazing fact that God, Almighty God, who made the whole universe, should be willing to enter into a covenant with us, his creatures. It's a proposal of marriage. Every covenant is a marriage in which he promises us and we accept or reject. Isn't that amazing? Furthermore, it's even more amazing to me that God is willing to take human names himself. He will always be known as the God of Abraham and Isaac, and Jacob, and they were men, human beings, tiny creatures on a little speck of stellar dust hurtling through space, which we call planet Earth. And the great God who made the whole universe says, I bind myself to these three men, a grandfather, a father, and a son, and he is forever after known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because he bound himself in an eternal covenant to those three men. Even Jesus himself, the Son of God, called his Father 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is the most astounding surprise in the Bible. And we should almost gasp with wonder that the God who made everything that is, is wanting to make a covenant with you. Astonishing. But he's not only a covenant-making God, and we ask, why does he do this? Why does he make covenants with tiny human beings who are just a drop in the bucket, who are nothing? Why does he do this? The answer is, he wants a relationship with us. But it's a relationship on his terms and his terms alone. It is not a relationship on our terms. And therefore, it is always a covenant relationship. Running right through the Bible from one end to the other is a phrase like this. I will be their God and they will be my people. You'll find that phrase on the very last page of the Bible, and it sums up the whole reason for a covenant-making God. He wants a relationship with us, because we're the only part of the universe that's made in his image, and he wants a relationship with his image. That's behind every covenant of all. Just amazing when you really consider it. I'm sometimes asked, why did God make human beings? Why did he make the human race? And my answer to that question is very, very simple. He already had one son, and he so enjoyed that son that he wanted a bigger family. I can't put it more simply than that. That's why we are here. That's the basic purpose of our lives, to seek God, to get into that relationship with him. That's why you and I were made. And until we find that covenant relationship with God, we will not find the purpose of our life. We will never find true satisfaction or fulfillment, because God made us for a covenant relationship. And that's why he put us here. <clears throat> and it must also tell us how disappointed he must be with so many of us, that we've been so preoccupied with getting money, getting play, becoming famous, with, even with just surviving that we have never bothered to seek his face. How grieved he must be at the human beings who have wasted their life and get to the end of life without having found its purpose. The other side to this is that we have a covenant keeping God. And every covenant is made on his basis of his promises, freely made, freely given. And we can absolutely rely on those promises. He is a God who keeps his word, a God who cannot tell a lie, a God who cannot break a promise. I once took a sheet of paper and wrote at the top of it, the things almighty God cannot do. And the first two things I wrote down, <clears throat> God cannot break a promise. God cannot tell a lie. And I went on writing, God cannot tell a dirty joke. God cannot, 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 cannot. And I soon got 30 things that Almighty God cannot do. And then I got a shock. I had done every one of them myself. And that didn't make me feel bigger than God. It made me feel very much smaller. 
I've done things Almighty God cannot do. That doesn't make me more powerful. It makes me a sinner in his eyes. Amazing that he's willing to make covenants with sinners, with people who have chosen to reject and rebel. And yet it is still true. He will make a covenant even with them. And he will keep it. And if he's made a promise, he will keep that promise. That's why this book is so precious. It's packed with his promises. And you can hold him to that. He is under obligation to himself to keep his word. Now, when you make a contract, you sign it or seal it very solemnly. If it's a very strong legal contract, you put a seal on it. God seals his covenants, too, in different ways. <clears throat> Sometimes in blood. In some gypsy weddings, they take the bridegroom's hand and they cut it and they cut the bride's hand and then they bind them together so that their blood flows and mixes. It's a covenant in blood. And some of the covenants of the Bible are sealed with blood. Abraham's was and the new covenant was in the blood of Jesus. But some of them are sealed with oaths with swearing. I'm talking about the kind of swearing, not just uh, bad use of language. But when you swear on oath, you do that in the law courts. In British law courts, they take a Bible. <clears throat> they make you put your hand on the Bible and say, I swear by Almighty God, that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And what they are doing is putting you under the fear of God that if you tell a lie, God will deal with you. He will kill you. That's the reasoning behind that oath. Of course, I'm afraid it's become a mere formality, and most people who say that, don't mean it, they don't understand what they're saying. They're saying, God, kill me if I tell a lie in this court. It's a very solemn way. Now, in all society, there is some kind of swearing, some kind of oath taken, and uh, woe betide us if we break that. Well now, usually we swear by something greater than ourselves so that they can exact the punishment if we tell a lie. So we swear by something or someone who is in a position to do that. But God has a problem. Who can he swear by? There's nobody greater than God that could kill him for telling a lie. So God, when he swears on oath in connection with the covenant, swears by himself because there is nobody greater than himself. And there are a number of occasions in Scripture where God swears by himself to keep a solemn covenant. He did that with Abraham. He swore by himself to keep the covenant forever. And that covenant with Abraham, as we shall see later, is still in operation. It is still being kept by the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob because he swore by himself. By God, he says, I will. <laughs> by myself, I have sworn to keep this covenant. That's a very strong confirmation of the covenant when God swears by himself. 
He's almost saying, if I tell a lie, I will commit suicide. I'll kill myself. That's an extraordinary implication of what he's saying when he swears by himself. So we have a covenant-making God and a covenant-keeping God, and we can rely implicitly on every covenant he has made. Now at last we are in a position to look at some of the covenants of Scripture. And the big questions are, number one, how many covenants are there in the Bible? And number two, how many put obligation on the Christian? And the answer to those questions is all important for our preaching and teaching of others. If we're not careful, we can put people under the wrong covenant. And that's happening on a wide scale in the churches today. Even the new churches very quickly put people under the wrong covenant. I'll give you examples of that when we come to it. Now you can take the sheet that I've given you. And I want you to look at the side of the sheet that is a chart, this particular side. We're going to be looking at five biblical covenants which are listed down the left-hand column. And each of them is named after the human being who was mainly concerned with the covenant being made by God. The first covenant we should look at, we call the Noahic covenant because it was made primarily with Noah and he has given his name to that covenant which God made with him. The second covenant that we're looking at was given to Abraham primarily, though to his sons and his descendants through him. But primarily it was made with Abraham, so we call it the Abrahamic covenant. The third we are going to look at was made with Moses on Mount Sinai when God married the nation of Israel. God himself said that was our marriage. That was, said, was when I said I will and you said we will. That was a marriage and forever afterwards God called himself the husband of Israel and called Israel his wife. When she went astray, he called her his adulteress and even his prostitute, but she was still his wife. That's the mosaic. Then the next covenant we'll consider is, was made with King David, so we call it the Davidic, and that's an amazing covenant. And finally, I call the New Covenant the Messianic because it was made with Christ our Messiah who was a human being as well as a divine being. But he introduced the New Covenant through his death. Now do you notice that only one of those five covenants is called New? and we have entered into that new covenant. But only one of the others is called the old covenant. And that's why the title to the larger part of your Bible, the Old Testament, is a wrong title. It's misleading. That part of your Bible contains the old covenant, which is the covenant made with Moses but it contains the three other covenants which are still in operation and which still apply to Christians. Christians are under obligation to four covenants 
out of the five. The one we are exempt from is the old covenant which was made with Moses. That's where so much of the misunderstanding and the misapplication of the covenants comes in. The old covenant we are finished with. It is now obsolete. I'm quoting the New Testament there, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, if you want a reference. The old covenant is past its sell-by date. It is obsolete. It is finished. And we are not bound by it. I'll illustrate that later, because that's the most common wrong covenant that people are put under. If your church insists on you tithing, they have put you straight back under the old covenant. And yet probably half the churches in Singapore are teaching people to tithe their income little realizing that they're, they're putting people under the wrong covenant. We'll come back to that later. I just wanted to give you an illustration. But when churches divide people into clergy and laity and have professional and amateur Christians, they're putting people back under the Mosaic covenant. When churches call their ministers priests or have an altar, or use incense, they are putting people back under the wrong covenant. You can see that there's a widespread misapplication of the word covenant among the churches. I'm going to add one, we'll justify it later. When people baptize babies, they're putting their people under the wrong covenant without realizing it. So we're dealing with very serious issues here and very important questions for the church. But I'll come to all that later. Now to explain the other part of this chart, look along the top. With each covenant, we are going to look at six important issues. And we're going to ask about each covenant Number one question, who was the covenant with? And we may get some surprises there. The party of the covenant. Secondly, we look at the promise of the covenant. What does God promise to do? What does he offer in that covenant? What does he say, I will? I've gone through my Bible and marked out every time the words I will come on God's lips, you will be astonished. It's hundreds of times. And God promises, I will do this. I will do that. And it goes through every page of the Bible almost. God is a God of promises. But we need to look at what is offered in each covenant. The next heading is proviso. What is expected of the humans with whom he has made the covenant? What response are we called upon to make? What does he expect us to do in relation to that covenant? The next question is, what is the penalty if we don't do it? If we fail on our side of the covenant, what will happen to us? The fifth question of every covenant is, how long was it made for? Is it permanent or is it temporary? How long? What is the period covered by the covenant? And the final question and the most important of all is, why did he make that covenant with human beings? What was the purpose behind it? Now I think you can see the rest of the covenant and you can all leave at this point, you've got it written down for you. 
I'm going to take you through it if you like to stay, but nevertheless you could take this sheet home with you and you've got it all. But I wanted you to have something to take home to remind you of the first talk. Let's begin then with the Noahic covenant that he made with Noah. The background to it is this. It's a very tragic background, a very sad background. I suppose the saddest verse in the Bible that I've ever read is in Genesis 6, where it said, and God regretted that he had made man. What a tragic statement that God himself should be sorry that he made any of us. And the reason is that mankind had reached the lowest possible level of perverted sex and violence. And those two things go together because they both treat people as objects and not as subjects. And even if you go to a video shop today, you'll see kinky sex and violence together on the shelves. They are the two worst things of human decadence. The sex that had happened was that angels were having sex with men. or rather with human women, that the angels saw the women on earth as fair and seduced them and had sexual intercourse with them. That's an extraordinary statement. Notice that in God's mind, God's creatures are in three levels, angels, humans, animals. We are not the highest creature in God's world, as most evolutionists believe. We are not the crown of creation. Angels are more powerful, more beautiful, more intelligent than us. They are God's highest beings. We are God's second highest beings, and animals are the third. And therefore God has forbidden sexual relations between angels and men and between men and animals. Tragically, both those things are coming back into popular entertainment and we are living in the days of Noah again. It's quite amazing that these things should rear their heads again. We know from a book called the Book of Enoch exactly what happened. There were 200 angels involved and they came to earth in the region of Mount Hermon and they had sex with human beings. That was the beginning of occult practices in the human race. It was the beginning of black magic. It was the beginning of a whole lot of things where Human beings wanted supernatural power, and that's what all occultism is. And it always leads to violence. When we disobey God's laws on sex, it isn't long before we become a violent society. And the two go together, and they're going together in our world now. One of the results of all this is that there's a verse that states, every imagination of man's heart was only evil continually. What an incredible statement. Man made in the image of God, given a beautiful earth to live in, had become totally depraved in their thinking. All that they could think of were things that God had forbidden. And God regretted that he had made men. Tragic. I've been in law courts where I've heard parents of young children say, we wish we'd never had them. And that, I think, is the saddest thing 
a parent could say about a child. And God said it about the human race. We wish we'd never made them. And he resolved to wipe the earth clean and start again. However, there was one man who was living right. Just one man in the whole world. His name was Noah. And he lived right, and he told others to live right. And no doubt his wife and his three sons and their wives listened to the old man, and they lived right with him. And God resolved that those eight people should survive and no others. And you know the rest of the story. Noah obeyed God and built an ark in the middle of the land where there was no water. What incredible faith and what mockery must have accompanied that faith. As people said, what are you doing? I'm building a boat. What for? Because it's going to float here. They said, but we're miles from the sea. Crazy man. And they mocked him. But the floods came. God had given full warning of that. There was a man in the Old Testament called Methuselah. And he was the oldest man on record in a in our scripture. 969 years he lived. And his name, Methuselah, means when he dies, it will happen. What a name. When he went to school first, and the teacher said, what's your name? When I die, it will happen. <laughs> and that was God's warning. 969 years before it happened. And it was, Noah was Methuselah's grandson or great-grandson, I forget which. And on the day the rain started, Methuselah died. That's interesting. He'd given a thousand years warning, nearly. God never brings disaster without giving full warning on people, to people. And if you read Amos, you'll find that argued by Amos the prophet, the lion roars before it attacks. And God always sends his prophets before he sends disaster. And they'd had full warning, and Noah had preached, but they didn't listen. Now the covenant was not made with Noah until the ark landed on dry ground and Noah came out and sacrificed to the Lord. And then the Lord said, I'm going to make a covenant with you and with the whole human race after you. And so the Noah covenant we are enjoying today, and I will show you that later too, because we're in it, the whole human race, all the descendants of Noah and his three sons and how it all developed from there. You'll read all that in the Old Testament. We're all in that Noahic covenant, and we should never forget that. And every day we can praise him for that because we woke up this morning and there was evidence that you could see with your eyes this morning that Noah's covenant is still working and that God has kept his promise. We'll look at those promises in a moment. So we know who God made the covenant with. What did God offer? In a word, survival. The Noahic covenant is a covenant of survival and survival of the entire human race. And the promise God made was, I will never do that again. 
Because he hasn't done it again, people don't take him seriously. But when Jesus talked about the end of the age, he said it would be as in the days of Noah. And we are approaching the days of Noah again. But God promised never to do it again until, and we'll come to the period later, that was his promise. I will preserve the human race. There will always be spring, summer, autumn, and winter. You will always have a harvest. And God has kept that promise. The reason why one-third of the human race goes to bed hungry and one-third is starving is very simple. The other third is struggling with obesity. And it's only because we will not share out the food there is in the world that so many people are without necessary food. The United Nations Food Organization has reported every year that there is enough food in the world to feed everybody even in spite of the exponential increase in population, there has been enough food in the world every year if it were rightly shed out. I was interviewed on Australian radio by a man who was very anti-God, and he said, how can God allow the children of Ethiopia to die from starvation. And he thought he'd made a good point. But I said, Mr. Lynch, the United Nations organization has said there is enough food in the world for everybody if we share it out properly. And that is the truth. That interview went to prison six months later, but there it was. He thought he had the last argument against God. How can a God of love allow this? It's almost as if a man locked his refrigerator up with a padlock and wouldn't let his children at the food and said, why is God letting my children starve? That's no more ridiculous than what we're doing in our world of today. Most of us have too much food. Most of us in a country like this, and in a country like England and America, we've got too much, and we don't share it. God has kept his promise. The seasons come and go with regularity. The crops come every year. And he's given us the ingenuity to develop new crops which yield more food, but we still won't share. I can't read the time, I'm afraid, Steve. Oh, I see, it's minutes first and then hours. I couldn't, he's reminding me what the time is. I've got 25 minutes more. Right, thank you. Now I know how to read it, right. Oh, it's minutes and seconds. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't like looking at my watch because if I do, all you will. <laughs> so let's move on. What did God expect of us in this covenant? Well, there were two things that he expected, but he didn't make them conditioned. They were voluntary, but the what he expected. And what God was saying in Noah's covenant is, I will preserve life. I will see that the conditions of life on earth continue, provided you do two things. First, that you preserve the sanctity of human life and treat it as sacred, and therefore that you will treat murder 
very seriously indeed as sacrilege. And sacrilege is to destroy, destroy something sacred. And therefore God expected us to treat human life as sacred. And therefore, listen carefully, he said, I expect you to take away the life of a murderer. Capital punishment was what God expected in the Noahic covenant. And he made it very clear that if anyone took another life, that he had destroyed the image of God and that society should then take his life. Now that's a fundamental principle that runs right through scripture. A murderer deserves to lose his life. That's a very serious thing. In most countries today, capital Western countries that is, capital punishment for murder has been abolished. In my country, it was abolished in the 60s. And I said to my wife at the time, that's the end of the sacredness of human life. And I said, the next thing will be abortion. And that followed in less than five years. And I said, after that will come euthanasia. And that's now coming in Europe. When you treat grandmother as the way you treat an old dog, and just put her down. It's already on the horizon. And it was lost in the 60s in our country when we abolished capital punishment for murder. And the punishment for murder became the punishment for serious theft, not sacrilege. You have robbed a person of life. Therefore, we rob you of life, not in the sense of taking your life, but putting you in prison, which is almost worse than life. We'll put you in prison for the rest of your life as a serious theft. Do you see the change that occurred? In other words, in the 1960s, Britain lost the Noahic Covenant. And yet God had not made that a condition. Isn't that amazing? He must have known we'd be sentimental about this because he didn't make it a condition. We have departed from the Noahic Covenant and yet we are not punished for that. But we need to remember that to God, life is sacred, both before birth and before death. It's still sacred, and you don't touch it. That is sacrilege. The other thing that God expected of people was that they would treat animals, not as sacred, because they're not in the image of God, that man could now eat animals for food. They were all vegetarians up till the flood, but now he said you can eat meat, but you must be absolutely sure that the animal is dead. And how to make sure of that was this. To God, blood is life. It's the blood in us that keeps us alive by circulation. And therefore, he said, you must kill animals in a way that releases all their blood, for the blood is the life. And so they cut the throats of animals that they were to eat for meat and drain the blood off. And that's the origin of uh, slaughtering by draining the blood. And it was virtually God saying, drain the life. Don't ever eat live animals. Don't ever eat meat with the blood in it. And that became, again, part of the Noahic Covenant. So that was the proviso, the penalty. Those provisos were expectations on the part of God 
They were not conditions. And thank God he didn't say if you don't kill murderers or if you don't, if you eat animals while there's still life in the flesh, if you do either of those two things, I will punish you. But he didn't say that. But he did expect it. Now how long would this covenant last? The answer is while the earth remains. It's a limited period. It's only for the life of planet earth. And it's not an everlasting covenant. Finally, the purpose. Why did God promise to allow the human race to survive? And the answer is because he wants that family. He wants that larger family. And he will keep the human race going until he gets that larger family. And we know from elsewhere in scripture that he wants every ethnic group in that family every kindred and tribe and tongue. And so he keeps us all alive until he gets the family he wants. And then will come another Noah period. Not this time by flood of water, but this time by fire that will burn up anything and everybody. Well now, that's the covenant of Noah. And we've dealt with one covenant, and I still have 16 minutes and 53 seconds. Let's move on into the Abrahamic covenant and see what that is. Because that is a covenant that still affects us. Before we move on, notice that the first covenant we're looking at was international. And it was a promise of God to send son and rain, the two requirements for food. Without light and moisture, we could have no food whatever. And the sign of the covenant that God gave was the rainbow. When sun and rain come together, you will see God's wedding ring in the sky, or part of it, and the interesting thing is that God put the rainbow not to remind you or me of this covenant, but to remind him of the promise he's made. Just as that wedding ring of mine reminds me of promises I've made and must keep, the rainbow reminds God himself of the promise he made to keep us fed and to keep us all going. And he has kept it. Now with Abraham, we turn from an international covenant with the whole human race to a national covenant, which would be international in its effect. So the next covenant is both national and international, as we shall see. But first, let's look at who it was made with. It was made first with Abraham, or Avraham, I should say, in Hebrew. And it was made a few years later with his son Isaac. And a few years after that, it was repeated again, word for word, with the grandson Jacob, who became Israel and gave his name to the nation that followed. And through those three men, known as the patriarchs, the fathers of the nation of Israel, God became the covenant God of a whole nation and still is. And the whole Middle East situation is a mess because the politicians are ignoring the Abrahamic covenant, which still applies to us as well as the Middle East. And through those patriarchs, it was made with the whole nation, the descendants of Abraham. 
and Isaac and Jacob. Notice that the Arabs are descendants of Abraham, but they're not descendants of Isaac or Jacob. They are descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's first son, who was born out of promise and indeed out of wedlock. But they are descended from that son. The descendants of Isaac and Jacob are the ones with whom the national part of this covenant was made. We by faith have become sons of Abraham and that's the international part of this covenant which includes everyone here. I hope, I'm assuming you're all Christians for a pastor's conference. Therefore, we're all sons of Abraham and we inherit part of the covenant, not all of it. The part that was made with his nation is only for the Jewish people, but the part that was made internationally is for us who by faith have become sons of Abraham. The promise was a promise of selection. God had a choice. As a parent, I had the same choice. Every Saturday I used to bring sweets or candies for my three children, and I had the choice either of giving one of them a bag of sweets and saying, share that with your brother and sister, or of giving them each a bar of chocolate or something separate. And from time to time, I did both. One of those methods led to peace in the house. The other one didn't. There was this childish, it's not fair, you've got more than I have, came into it when I gave all the sweets to one to share. God chose that second method. He selected one nation who would share him with everybody else. And to many philosophers, that's an offense. They call it the scandal of particularity. And what they mean is how offensive that God should choose one nation and that we've got to find God through that nation. This is a real offense, the scandal of particularity. But it's the way God chose to select one nation and through that nation to bless all the others. I can understand how offensive people think that. Why couldn't they make, why couldn't God send the Messiah to Singapore? Or to America, or to Russia, or to Britain? We all like to think of ourselves as the best nation on earth and even the chosen nation of God. America thinks that, a lot of them. And Britain used to think that, that we were God's chosen nation. There's only one chosen nation on earth and that's the Jewish nation. And it's through them that you find God. It's through them that you will be blessed by God. It's through them that you'll find a covenant for you. And that is an offense, but it's God's choice. And he selected Abraham and his descendants to bless every nation on earth. And we need to understand this covenant in its two parts. To one part, the Jews, he promised seed and land. He promised Abraham descendants as many as the stars in the sky. And Abraham could have seen with the naked eye 6,000 stars. We now know there are far more than that. And he would have descendants like the sand on the seashore. In other words, a number that you cannot count. And he promised them a land that they could live in. And God defined that land and defined it by its boundaries. 
twice. He defined it. And so he promised Abraham physical seed and a land for them to live in. And that promise still applies. At the moment, for example, there are only half the Jews who've gone back into the Middle East. Half the nation is still scattered, particularly in America, but not solely in America. And they have to come back if God is to keep his promise. So those Christians who think that the Jews have all come back to Israel need to think again. Only half of them have come back. Furthermore, they've only got a third of the land God promised to them. And if God keeps his promises, they're going to get much more of the Middle East. All this is relevant. And in your daily newspaper, you're reading about arguments about the people and the land. Physical arguments, violent arguments. The whole Middle East situation depends on this covenant being kept and on Israel welcoming the stranger among them. For that's part of the covenant as well, we'll see. But there I'm getting into modern days. Let's go back to the original covenant. So seed and land for Abraham and his descendants and internationally, through you, I will bless all the nations of the earth. And to that international promise, God added another, an extraordinary promise. Whoever blesses you, I will bless. And whoever curses you, I will curse. He's meaning that our attitude to the Jewish people is all important for our blessing or cursing. That again is most relevant politically because that promise still applies. And we need to remember, remember that God is a God who blesses and curses people. And that is related to our attitude to his chosen, selected people, the Jews. Now let's move on to the proviso. There was only one really, and that was the sign of circumcision. And if every descendant of Abraham wanted to claim the covenant, they must be circumcised, a physical sign in the flesh, on the organ of reproduction. And of course, in the Bible, all inheritance is through the male. And so it was a sign of the Jewish male that he was in the covenant. And indeed, God said, if any of you refuses to be circumcised, he is out of the covenant. That's absolutely essential on your part that you circumcise every male descendant. You're all looking terribly serious, so I'm going to tell you a joke. <laughs> but I only heard it very recently, but I found it very humorous. I hope you will. But it's not one that you can tell your congregations. <laughs> there was a man who looked at all the religions of the world to decide which one would suit him best. And after studying Islam and Buddhism, he finally settled on Judaism and believed that if he adopted the Jewish religion, then he would be the happier man. And so he found a local rabbi and went to him and said, uh, I'm a Gentile, but I want to become a Jew. I believe your religion is right. And the rabbi took him through all the Jewish doctrines and all the Jewish duties. And finally, the rabbi said, I think I ought to tell you that there is a rather small surgical operation that will be needed before you can become a Jew. And the man said, is it very painful? 
And the rabbi said, well, I was only eight days old when it was done to me, so I don't remember. <laughs> he said, I do remember one thing. I couldn't walk for a whole year afterwards. <laughs> well, now you can, if you've got the same perverted sense of humor as I have, I think that's a funny thing, but that's the sign. If you want to claim the covenant of Abraham and you are Jewish, then you must be circumcised. That's the only requirement that God made for this covenant. Of course, Abraham was a man of faith. And it was his faith that saved him. This covenant does not save the Jewish people. It gives them a future and a land. But salvation is for those Jews and Gentiles who have the faith of Abraham. That's not a requirement of the covenant because the covenant is not a covenant of salvation. It's a covenant of selection of one nation to bless all the nations of the earth. What would happen if a man wasn't circumcised? He'd be cut off from the nation forever. If he was not willing to have that part of his body cut off, his whole body would be cut off from the covenant. What would be the result of this covenant on the nations? Well, simply, if nations blessed Israel, they would be blessed. And if nations cursed Israel, they would be cursed. And I believe if you read history, you read the fulfillment of this covenant. Where are the Egyptians now? Egypt is full of Arabs, not Egyptians. Where are the Romans now? Where are the Babylonians now? Where are the Assyrians now? Where are the Greeks now? All of these empires have risen and fallen. Where is Israel now? Back on the map after 2,000 years. You can see if you take a broader view of history that God has blessed those who bless Israel and cursed those who curse. In 1947, Britain washed her hands of Israel. Within five years, the British Empire had disappeared. When I was at school, the, the atlas of the world was mostly red, not for communist red, but for British red. Singapore was red, British. And the British Empire stretched right round the globe, the empire on which the sun never set. It was boasted. And yet within five years of Britain washing her hands of Israel, she was gone. And we now still have Gibraltar and the Falklands and a few scattered little pieces around the globe. That's all we are. The great British Empire went so quickly. And while politicians have their reasons for that, I believe in God's sight, he was saying, if you can't look after my people, you can't look after any other people. That's my understanding of the covenant with Abraham. How long would it last? And the answer is, it was everlasting. Time and again, God said, this covenant will last forever. The Jews will always be God's selected people. And they will still be there at the end of history, when all other empires have come and gone. The name Israel will still be on the map. Now, why was, why was this covenant brought into being? What was the purpose of it? He wanted a kingdom of priests on earth. A priest is someone who mediates between people and God. And he wanted a kingdom of priests who would bring the world to God and bring God to the world and mediate on behalf of everybody else. 
Now they have, of course, missed this calling terribly. And they've suffered terribly for it. And for 2,000 years they've been without their own language, their own coinage, their own territory or anything of their own. But they're back on the map again. And God will have mercy on them. He never breaks a covenant if it's a covenant that is everlasting. 